very warm welcome to you this morning. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Welcome to our service today. Kerry's going to shortly be challenging us as we reflect on our readings and reflect on our attitude and whether we are, in fact, walking humbly with God. Look forward to hearing that a little bit later on. But why don't I just open up in prayer before we have our opening hymn. Loving God, on this beautiful, fine spring day, we thank you that we can gather as a church community that we do have the freedom here in New Zealand to come and worship you. And so as we listen to scripture through music, through prayer, may we hear your words speaking to us, challenging us, encouraging us. We ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So as I said, we are here as God's people come to worship God. So our opening hymn, our opening song, God is here as we his people meet to offer praise and prayer. Let us stand to worship God. Good morning. Good morning, Christine. Today, our service is from page 456, if you want to follow it from the prayer book. It's a thanksgiving for creation and redemption. So, in the name of God, creator, redeemer, and giver of life, Amen. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God and our creator, the love at our beginning and without end, in our midst and with us. God is with us. Here we find new life. Let us give thanks for the coming of God's reign of justice and peace. 
Jesus Christ is good news for the poor, release for the captives, recovery of sight for the blind, and liberty for those who are oppressed. So now, as we um, sit or kneel, the young people are going to be going out to their activities and we pray for them. We especially pray today for those who were confirmed last week, as well as the children and the leaders of these groups as they meet this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Creator, we disfigure your world. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Redeemer, we reject your redemption and crucify you daily. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Giver of life, we too often choose death. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. God, the creator, brings you new life, forgives and redeems you. Take hold of this forgiveness and live your life in the spirit of Jesus. Amen. So the sentence for today is, be merciful to me, a sinner. Let us say the prayer together. Forgiving God, your covenant is firm. Be merciful to us and grant us to live in your presence, ever singing your praise through Jesus Christ, our liberator, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So now we move to the reading, so the readers will come up. The Old Testament reading is from Jeremiah, chapter 14, beginning at verse 7. Although our iniquities testify against us, act, O Lord, for your name's sake. Our apostasies indeed are many, and we have sinned against you. O hope of Israel, its saviour in time of trouble, why should you be like a stranger in the land? like a traveller turning aside for the night? Why should you be like someone confused, like a mighty warrior who cannot give help? Yet you, O Lord, are in the midst of us, and we are called by your name. Do not forsake us. Thus says the Lord concerning this people, truly they have loved to wander. They have not restrained their feet, Therefore the Lord does not accept them. Now he will remember their iniquity and punish their sins. Have you completely rejected Judah? Does your heart loathe Zion? Why have you struck us down so that there is no healing for us? We look for peace but find no good for a time of healing but there is terror instead. We acknowledge our wickedness, O Lord, the iniquity of our ancestors, for we have sinned against you. Do not spurn us for your name's sake. Do not dishonor your glorious throne. Remember and do not break your covenant with us. Can any idols of the nations bring rain, or can the heavens give showers? It is not you, O Lord our God. We set our hope on you, for it is you who did all this. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church.
a reading from 2 Timothy chapter 4 beginning at verse 6. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. At my first defense, no one came to my support, but everyone des deserted me. May it not be held against them. But the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed, and all the Gentiles might hear it. And I was delivered from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Reading from the Gospel according to Luke, beginning at chapter 18, verse 9. Praise Praise the glory to God. He also told this parable to some who were trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. <clears throat> For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. You might like to be seated. In the name of God, creator, redeemer, and giver of life. Amen. As faithful Anglicans, we know that wherever Anglican worship occurs, whether in corporate worship in church or in personal devotion in one's home, there is an established format that guides our worship. Fundamental to that worship is the need for forgiveness for the wrong we have done and for the good we have not done, for disfiguring God's world, for the sins that are plain to us, the sins that escape us, and those we cannot face. These words of confession, which we know well, run much deeper than printed text on a page and spoken word recounted. For in their expression, we acknowledge our sins and faults, seeking God's forgiveness, allowing ourselves to be reshaped and refined, becoming more Christ-like. Our time of confession is a spiritual matter solely between ourselves and God. 
through our sincere penitence, we are assured that we are forgiven and strengthened and we become reconciled once again to the God who loves and cares for us. In the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector, Jesus aims his critique at some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. A Pharisee who was supposed to be a model of spiritual life and a tax collector who was despised by the people and regarded as a sinner. The Pharisee turned the time of confession into an exposition. And his prayer, which consisted of telling God all about his own good points, he exalts himself and denounces the tax collector. The tax collector, however, is the one whose faith sees through to the great heart of God, and he casts himself on the divine mercy. He considers himself unworthy of even looking up to God and shows great sorrow, beating his breast and signifying great sorrow. He says just one sentence of genuine prayer. God be merciful to me, a sinner. This genuine prayer doesn't spring from boasting about one's faithfulness, but from a sense of unworthiness of receiving God's mercy. The tax collector assumes the humble demeanour of one who has erred or sinned, which the Pharisee refuses to do. Do we recognise this character type within our own lives? Lord, I tithe regularly. I work in the mission shop three times a month. I serve on vestry. I'm on the hospitality roster. I am a long-serving member of the St. Aidan's Parish. Could it be that at times we are guilty of being deceived by a sense of our own righteousness? A superior attitude encourages one to think more highly of themselves at the expense of others. But Jesus is dismissive of this notion. He emphasizes this in the statement, for all who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Which he uses in this passage and again in Luke's gospel when commenting on the conduct of those who elevate themselves to places of honour at a banquet. As we've heard in the lesson, the backsliding people of Jeremiah's time call on the Lord to once again save Israel. Their sense of self-importance as God's people gives them a false sense of security that whatever happens and whatever they do, God will protect them. But their flattery and manipulation will not have the desired result. The Lord remembers their waywardness and will put them through a refiner's fire. Their redemption will be a long time coming, but it will come. The Lord will abandon his people, but it is temporary. It is the Lord's way of demonstrating tough love. Although they are wicked and have sinned against God and broken their covenant with him, he will not reject them entirely. His capacity to show mercy and to forgive knows no bounds. And the Apostle Paul is reflecting to Timothy on the end of his life and ministry. He is convinced that the moment is drawing near. He wants his audience to think of his life and imminent death as an offering that is poured out. Paul is to die a martyr's death. So the idea of Paul's life as a drink offering poured out to God makes one thing very clear. No authority, no government, no empire can take Paul's life. Yes, he will be killed, but Paul has already offered his life back to God. In evaluating his life, Paul offers images. He has fought the good fight. 
and that he has demonstrated the courage and determination in spreading the gospel. Secondly, he has completed the race. He has finished the course set before him. Thinking of one's life as a goal-directed journey or a race is fundamental to the way Paul taught his followers to imagine their own lives. And finally, Paul says, I have kept the faith, which describes someone who observes the commandments and can mean preserving or protecting something. Paul has both kept the faith in the sense that his life reflects loyalty to the gospel, and he has guarded the faith, which he is now passing on to Timothy. Taking these three assertions together, Paul is reflecting on his life in Christ. He expresses the view that the Lord, the righteous judge, will award him the crown of righteousness, along with those who have longed for the appearing of Christ. Although Paul's work in promoting the gospel and establishing churches was extensive, he knows that no one can earn their way into God's favour, like we heard with the Pharisee. Paul's faith and determination was unparalleled, yet he was resolute in his belief by justification that drove him to love and serve God to the very end. Which brings us back to our parable. Like Paul, there is nothing that we can do to merit God's favour. Yet with a contrite and sincere heart, we might heed the example of the tax collector and appeal to God's steadfast love with the words, God be merciful to me, a sinner. That we too might be vindicated. In the contrast between the proud and the humble, we have a picture of a God who reverses the position of the arrogant elite and the humble poor. We see this in Mary's Magnificat, where God has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts and lifted up the lowly. And in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, where the poor Lazarus gains eternal rest in heaven, while the rich man's life is one of torment in hell. So let us be drawn to identify with the tax collector, with his demonstration of humility, as opposed to the Pharisee who, who displays a sense of moral superiority. Jesus reveals what the divine judge would say about this. It is the tax collector, not the Pharisee, who returned home vindicated. In coming to God, we do so with true humbleness, not presenting a report of the good we have done to justify ourselves. God has already given us the way to be reconciled to himself. It is through his son, Jesus Christ, who died our death to atone in full for our sins and shortcomings. We cannot do anything to earn this gift. We can but recognize that we are sinners and seek God's mercy and grace through prayer. God be merciful to me, a sinner. Amen. Thank you, Kerry. Let us stand to affirm our faith. You, O God, are supreme and holy. You create our world and give us life. Your purpose overarches everything we do. You have always been with us. You are God. You, O God, are infinitely generous good beyond all measure. You came to us before we came to you. You have revealed and proved your love for us in Jesus Christ, who lived and died and rose again. You are with us now. You are God. You, O oh God, are Holy Spirit. You empower us to be your gospel in the world. You reconcile and heal. You overcome death. 
You are our God. We worship you. And so we sit or kneel for our intercessions. Let us pray for the church and for the world, giving thanks for God's goodness. Caring God, we thank you for your gifts in creation. As we see spring unfold around us and think of those away this weekend exploring our country, we pray for our world, the heavens tell of your glory, for our land, its beauty and its resources, for the rich heritage we enjoy. We pray for wisdom in balancing moves to reduce greenhouse gas emissions with possible reductions in food production and we continue to seek ways of individually and collectively changing our lives in response to climate change. We pray for those who make decisions about the resources of the earth, that we may use your gifts responsibly. For those who work on the land and sea, in city and in industry, that all may enjoy the fruits of their labors and marvel at your creation. For artists, scientists, and visionaries, that through their work we may see creation afresh. We thank you for giving us life, for all who enrich our experience. We think of all those known and unknown to us in need of your loving and healing care, particularly people affected by floods and other natural disasters. We pray for all who are deprived of fullness of life, for prisoners, refugees, and those who are sick, for those in politics, medical science, social and relief work, and for your church, for all who seek to bring life to others. We thank you that you have called us to celebrate your creation. Give us reverence for life in your world. As we ponder what we have heard in our sermon today, Lord God, we thank you we pray, God, creator, bring us new life. Jesus, redeemer, renew us. Holy Spirit, strengthen and guide us. Blessed are you, God of growth, and discovery, yours is the inspiration that has altered and changed our lives. Yours is the power that has brought us to new dangers and opportunities. Set us, your new creation, to walk through this new world, watching and learning, lo loving and trusting, until your kingdom comes. Amen. As Christ teaches us, we pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We come now to the time in our service where we share the peace with one another. So as you are able, I invite you to stand. 
Blessed be Christ, the Prince of Peace. The peace of God be always with you. Praise to Christ who unites us in peace. So as you are able and as you are comfortable, I invite you to share that peace with one another and now. So we move to our offertory hymn, remembering that the offertory box is at the back of the church. Today it is, may the mind of Christ my Saviour live in me from day to day. God, as we do run that race, may we do so with humility as we draw ever closer to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Loving God, we just thank you for the gifts that have been given. Food for the city mission. Money for the ministry in this place. May all those who receive be blessed. Amen. The Lord is here. God's spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to offer thanks and praise. It is indeed right always and everywhere to give thanks to you, the true and living God, through Jesus Christ. You are the source of life for all creation, and you made us in your own image. In your love for us, you sent your Son to be our Saviour. In the fullness of time, he became incarnate, suffered death on the cross. You raised him in triumph and exalted him in glory and through him you send your Holy Spirit upon your church and make us your people. And so we proclaim your glory as we say, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Do you indeed be glory, almighty God? Because on the night before he died, your son, Jesus Christ, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this to remember me. 
and after supper he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for you. Do this as often as you drink it to remember me. So with thanksgiving and hope we say, glory to you, Lord Christ, your death we show forth, your resurrection we proclaim, your coming we await. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Therefore, loving God, recalling now Christ's death and resurrection, we ask you to accept this, our sacrifice of praise. Send your Holy Spirit upon us in our celebration, that we may be fed with the body and blood of your Son, and be filled with your life and goodness. Strengthen us to do your work and to be your body in the world. United in Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we raise to you, O God, our songs of everlasting praise. Blessing, honour and glory be yours, here and everywhere, now and forever. Amen. Christ's body was broken for us on the cross. Christ is the bread of life. His blood was shed for our forgiveness. Christ is risen from the dead. So come, God's people. Come to receive Christ's heavenly food. You may like to be seated as the team come forward. Particularly if you're visiting here, just a reminder of how we, we work here at St. Aidan's. We've got hand sanitizer as you come forward. We have uh, bread in the, uh, that will be served here from outwards in the there's wine in the chalice, and then on the outside edge there is grape in the small cups. So come, God's people, the table is ready.
be around for too many years. Most loving God, creator and redeemer, we give you thanks for this foretaste of your glory. Through Christ and with all your saints, we offer ourselves and our lives to your service. Send us out in the power of your spirit to stand with you in your world. We ask this through Jesus Christ, the servant, our friend and brother. Amen. So as we go from here, as we run the race, may we always walk humbly before God. And the blessing of God, creator, redeemer and giver of life be with you today and always. Amen. It's our tradition in our parish to celebrate with people when there are birthdays, anniversaries, exciting things happening. So I know last week we didn't have birthdays and celebrations. I noticed it's because we had a sort of a slightly longer service with confirmation. We had lots of guests and visitors with us. So we missed out on some birthdays. So I know we've got some chocolates and some bookmarks to distribute. So Stuart, was it your birthday last week? Is that right? Fantastic. A special one, a, a gold card special one. Whoa, congratulations, Stuart. He gets to ride the buses for free. What, certainly something worth celebrating in Auckland. Jenny, wedding anniversary, so Brian might want a chocolate as well then. <laughs> congratulations, you too. Is he? Elsa's birthday. It can't be have come around already, has it, Elsa? My word. I'm going to embarrass myself now and say probably the wrong year. Is she six, seven? Eight. Oh, my goodness. Elsa, I remember when you were five. Crikey, congratulations. Eight years old. I bet mum and dad are feeling older already. We've got some other arrows going. Is it? Are we pointing at David Cotton, are we? Congratulations, David. Happy birthday for Friday. And Pete. A birth your birthday? Happy birthday, Pete. Goodness me, what was nine months ago? It was obviously a good time. Lots of birthdays. Fantastic. Julie. Lillian is 103 tomorrow, which means we must also have Rosemary's birthday coming around the corner too as well. 103, dear Lillian. Beverly, Nine, 95 years old. Well done, Beverly. <laughs> Nothing wrong with the water and the things in, in St. Aidan's. We grow them good here, don't we? 103 and 95. Crikey. Is that everybody? I think so. Okay. Well done, people. Okay. Let's just move on to our notices. Uh, do have a look through the newsletter. I'm not going to go through all of them. Just a couple I do want to point out. Um, we've been asking you to pray about our upcoming AGM where Vestry is... Um, nominated and voted on. Uh, the nomination forms are now out in the gathering area. <coughs> so if you want to um, nominate someone or speak to someone about that, all the information is out there. So that's for the AGM. Do carefully pray about that. Uh, the other thing is I know that Anne spoke, uh, not last week, but maybe the week before, about the writing group. So this is a, a brand new venture, a brand new group that is starting up. They're going to be meeting once a month. And this time when they meet, they're going to be particularly writing and decorating Christmas cards to reach people in prison in New Zealand. So the information is here on your newsletter sheet. Uh, this is a group that won't be writing on behalf of St Aidan's, but as individuals, but supporting one another, and particularly sort of things like social justice issues and you will have your, perhaps your own concerns but as Anne is here today if you want to know more there she is waving a hand if you want to know some more speak to Anne this Friday they've kindly moved from the gathering area they had booked the space but we also had a, a, a clash of bookings and that was um, the group who are trying to sort out the kitchen and the building proposed building out there so they're going to meet in the social lounge very kindly this week um, but normally they would be meeting in the gathering area 
Postal magazine, it comes around pretty quickly for the team of Anne and Isabel who put it together. There's the theme, a patchwork Christmas. Have a little look. If you can think you can write something that'll uh, contribute to the magazine, do hand it in to Anne or speak to her if you want to know further. That will do. The rest you can read for yourself. Our final hymn as we consider what we've heard today, as we consider taking that message back out and making a difference in our lives, tell out my soul the greatness of the Lord. We have got many blessings that sometimes we can overlook and sometimes we just need to be reminded of them. So let us stand to close our worship this morning. Thank you. Grace be with you. Go in peace. Amen. We go in the name of Christ.